I'm here with my grandfather, the one and only, yes, you are. the one and only Aaron Beckwith, and he has such an interesting life with so many stories that he's told me over the years, and I often find I can't remember all the details of them. I asked him to sit down and tell me a couple stories. So here we are. Today is January something. Yeah. 2009. And we're visiting in Florida, Delray Beach. And Grandpa's going to tell a story or two. All right. Here wanna... we go. Okay. Uh, this has kind of caught me so that without rehearsal, I'll do the best I can. And you know, I'm 95 years old now, and it's hard to remember all the stories. So let's start kind of with when I re really began to live, and that was when I married your grandmother or your great-grandmother or your great-grandmother, wherever you fall. and. Uh, the year was 1957, and here we go. When I would get home, I would play in a band every night. They called, uh, every, almost every fraternity would be running a dance at some time, and I had to do a little selling and we would get the work. And Mildred managed to get a date to a lot of these things. And she danced by me and thumb her nose at me, you know. When you were playing? When I was playing, yeah. Is that how you met when you were in a No, band? but wait. Uh, no, we had met. I met her at, at a hall at Syracuse. But uh, I, my father had an old car, an old Willie's Night it was called. And I used to drive to the sorority house when I got through playing a job, which was usually 12 o'clock. You played 9 to 12. And I would slowly pull up behind the back of the sorority house where, was, where there was a fire escape. Mm -hmm. And Mildred would come down the fire escape and it could be by that time maybe 12, 15 or so. She was sneaking out. If she got caught, she could have been thrown out of school. <laughs> and if I got caught, the police would have helped, got me for some. It sounds like Romeo and Juliet. We were. We were, only she was a beautiful Juliet and I was a pretty ugly Romeo. <laughs> Finally, after a long courtship through college, uh, Grandma decided she wasn't going to wait any longer and she wanted to get married right away. And I called her up one night and the idea was as soon as I would make $40 a week, we would be making enough money to get married. And it sounded good. But suddenly, I got a new job at a radio station, and it paid at least $40 a week with opportunity of making much more. So I quit my uncle's store and took the job, but all my friends had cars, and unfortunately, your great-great-grandfather, or whatever I was, had no money to This was your father? Of. No. Your no. grandfather. This was me. Oh, you? Yeah. And uh, I called Grandma up and I said to her, uh, hey, I just got a new job. And she said, how much does it pay? And I said, well, it starts at 40 a week, and it looks like we can do much better. She said, all right, I'll let you know uh, when I'll be ready. And I said, well, look, 
why don't we postpone it for six months? I've never had anything of my own. It was always something that I had to contribute to the family with or something like that. And I said, why don't we wait a while? I'd like to buy a car and we can get married later on. And uh, Grandma said, you can't do that with me. She said, I've waited and waited for you, and I want to get married right now. And I said, but I want a car. I want to have a car like all the other fellas. And she started to cry. And the Beckwith family were always sucker for tears. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> all right, we'll get married. Sounds kind of stupid on my part, but I'm so glad I did it, and if I was smart, I would have done it before. Anyhow, we're getting married. We have nothing to start with. So her father says, I'll buy you a car, and that'll get you started. I was a salesman then for WSYR Radio. Television was just getting started. So I started there, and but before we did, we ha he gave us a big wedding near Scranton. As a, uh, what year was your wedding? 1957, I think. 70 years ago. 71 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Does that, and it was uh, before I was born. That well, long, long before you were born. Now, I figured he'd come up with a trim little something, and instead of that, he had delivered to us a brand new La Cell, which was the small version of a Cadillac with all the glamour and all the leather and wood and so forth. What color was it? It was a black and it had two people who sat in front and a couple of seats in the back that you pull out of this seat in front of you. Is so it the rumble it seat they called it? No, the rumble seat was out of the car and on the back. Oh. Anyhow, it was a beautiful car, and I was kind of ashamed of it because everybody knew I didn't have the money to buy a car. And uh, what happened was we came home. I'd been uh, to Scranton, where we were, M Mildred is from, and we got married there. And before I got there, I found out to my chagrin that my father-in-law had asked if he could drive the car to New York. And Mildred said, yes, but be careful. Well, he got into an accident. God forbid he wasn't hurt, but the car was total. The brand new car. The brand new Before car. Before you ever even got to drive it? Right. And right. when we got to Scranton, when I got to Scranton, uh, there was no car to go in the uh, go on the honeymoon with. I thought, but then he said, "Take my car. Go on your honeymoon, and when you come back, we'll have a new car waiting for you." Well, anyhow, his car was a great big Cadillac that specialized in stalling every time we got to a signal. <laughs> and I'd have to go out and the guy behind me would help me push me a little bit to get it started. Okay. We went to Saratoga first because a fellow who did all the advertising for Saratoga said, come here. And I said, oh, Saratoga, that's too much money. And besides, we're definitely going to New York. He said, you come to Saratoga 
And he said, I know every horseman in the place because I write the programs and talk to them. And I, I'm sure by the time you're through, you'll have double the money that you have to spend in the yard. So we did. And the first day, we lost every race. <laughs> and the second day, we honestly lost every race. On the third day, I, we had lost the first three races, and I turned to Mildred and said, if we were to lose another race, we could not afford to go on our honeymoon to New York. So she said, let's go. So we left the racetrack, hadn't won a race there, and got to New York. and. Almost all the little money we had was gone from the racetrack, but we had the promise of a new car, and I had this new job, which I knew was going to do well for us. And we worked our way slowly to New York City. We had a wonderful time in New York City with all kinds of stories. I must tell you this then. We wanted to go to the roof garden of the Roosevelt where an orchestra by the name of Guy Lombardo was playing. I think I've heard of him. You can still buy Guy Lombardo records, although he's been gone for over 70 years. And uh, we went up to the Roosevelt, and then as luck would have it, there was a line up on the roof garden because everybody wanted to hear Guy Lombardo. And I don't know how I got the courage, but I walked up to the guy and I said to the Metro D, hey, I'm stuck. It's my honeymoon. And as it is right now, we're at the back of the line, although the main part of the honeymoon was going to be the hotel. What can I do? He said, is your wife, where is your wife? And there was Mildred. She was wearing her beautiful white dress that she wore to her wedding. And he came and politely got us both, took us right around to the front. He said, you see that table down there? Right near the floor, near the music. He said, you go there, that's your table. Wow. And I was, aghast. I didn't know what to do. It was such a great turn in, in our benefit. And uh, as he led us to the table, I pulled, I think, probably a dollar out of my pocket or something. And he said, look, you have a good honeymoon and forget any money just have a good time. And that was probably one of the nicest things that happened to me, especially on my honeymoon. And, that, and Guy Lombardo was playing there and you got to... Guy Lombardo was wow. playing. We were first row. Our grandma looked absolutely beautiful. Uh, I was wearing my tuxedo. I think I didn't wear it again for 45 years. <laughs> but uh, we had the time of our life. However, we got back to Scranton and we still didn't have a car. But he said, go home. And I've forgotten how we got home. I think we got back to Syracuse on a ride with another fellow. But anyhow, I immediately went looking for a car and I saw a beautiful Buick, which was a two-seater called Buick 
coupe, they call it. And that's how we got our first car, and we used it, and we went to Scranton very off, often. The car rode nicely, and thank God, Mildred had such generous, loving parents. So the moral of the story is don't bet on horses. Right, don't bet on horses. And if somebody says, I'm going to give you a car, make sure he gives it to you first before you do anything else. Don't let somebody else drive it to New York first. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's just as well. He had bought a new Cadillac for us. Uh -huh. And that was too big and ostentatious. <laughs>